All right, it is five o'clock. We can get started just because we have a lot to do in this class and I don't want to lose a minute. I want to make sure that I can at least show you as much of a finished product as possible. But this is a um, classic roast chicken that has been brined. So if you are following along, hopefully you got the email to brine it overnight. Um, that is key. If you you do it in the morning, you know, in time for dinner that night, that's still okay. You're going to have a really delicious, flavorful chicken. But a solid 24 hours is uh, optimal. You're, you'll um, you'll end up with a very tender, very juicy, delicious, uh, already flavored and seasoned, ready to go piece of chicken. So if you are using a whole chicken or chicken pieces, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's still going to be really delicious. You're just going to cook them uh, slightly different times. Uh, the roast chicken will, the whole chicken will take longer than the pieces because it's still got a lot more bone and a lot more area to cook. So um, if you are cooking along with me, uh, everyone saw the waiver when they registered for the class, just please be aware that uh, there's a risk in this kind of activity. And if you hurt yourself or anything, please stop right away and seek medical attention or first aid. Um, I have, like I said, got my chicken brined and ready to go. I pulled it out of the brine um, about 20 minutes ago. And air, it's just been air drying. I, I did use a couple of paper towels to pat dry also, but you want to just make sure that it's, it's dry. Um, no liquid still dripping off or pouring off, especially in any of the little crevices where the wings attach or the legs attach. You want to make sure that it, the surface is as dry as you can possibly make it. That is going to give you a nice, nice crispy uh, skin. Um, which is also why we are not going to be basting it to start with. We're putting it right into the oven just like this. If you don't have a rack like this, this is an actual roasting rack for large pieces of roasting meats, and you can use like one of those flat cooling racks that you cool cookies on if you have an extra one of those. That would help just to keep it uh, that half inch off of the surface so that air can help get underneath it. That will ensure that the skin underneath gets nice and crispy as well. But if you don't have that, that's also perfectly fine. It can just go right on the sheet pan with uh, some foil just for easy cleanup at the end, as always. Um, especially with this, there's going to be drippings and juices and whatnot. And so you want to make cleanup a lot easier for yourself, not ruin your sheet pan. We're going in at a very high heat. We're at 475 right now to start with. Um, we're going to be lowering it after our first 15 minutes, but for now we want to hit it with that really, really high roast to, like I said, help finish drying it out, get that skin nice and starting to um, dry out. The fat starts to render really quickly, and so we get a nice crisp effect. Um, then we are going to start basting it. We're using an extra virgin olive oil, or if you have an olive oil canola blend just to help save money, that is perfectly fine. Those are both good oils. Um, if you wanted to throw in a little teeny, maybe a half a tablespoon of butter into your basting liquid, that would also be perfectly fine. Extra delicious, um, but not necessary. And so you can actually, uh, this is a way to keep chicken dairy free, which might sound a little counterintuitive, but there are people who can't have dairy, but are not necessarily vegan. So uh, if you don't slather it in butter, then it's okay for those people, which is usually only an issue when you cater weddings and like one out of 200 people has them. But, so you can choose any of those different options of basting, but we're gonna do that every 15 minutes or so. Right now, nothing is on this. That brine did all of the work for us. It's got that 50% salt to brown sugar ratio with a whole lot of delicious spices and herbs and seasonings. So nothing is going on this in terms of more salts, we might hit it with a little bit of pepper at the end. If you really, really like pepper during basting, you can do that. But um, it had the peppercorns and pepper in the brine, so it should have a pretty good, well-rounded sense of flavor. I need to move my oven rack down. Class yesterday, we had it way up top. My rack right in the middle, um, as, as close to the middle as your chicken can be with also the, the height that you might be adding if you're using a rack, but you want it right in the middle of the oven, as middle as possible, 475 for 15 minutes. 
And then we're going to then we're going to start basting it. Turn the heat down to I think I put three seventy five. Yes. Um, and then at that point we can throw in some of our veggies to start roasting. If we put them in now, not only would they be done far too early, um, they would be done very very brown because the oven is extremely hot, like even hotter than we want it to be when we're normally roasting vegetables. So when we turn it down to 375, that'll be a little bit more tolerable for the, what we're dealing with. The recipe says with market vegetables, because I want you to keep in mind that you can use anything. Um, I put carrots, asparagus, cauliflower, but you see here, I'm also using snap peas because I have some from last week's farmer's market that should be used soon. And I really love roasted snap peas. Brings out a lot of that natural sugar, makes them really crispy and delicious, so I'm just going to be throwing that in. You can, any market vegetables, any vegetables that you like, um, roast them up and serve them with your chicken. This is just an assortment of some of some, a good classic uh, farmer's market spread. And I did get all of this at a farmer's market, so I was very lucky that the baby carrots I got are already extremely small. This little guy I don't need to cut. I'm just going to roast him whole. Carrot tops, the greens, are edible, good for you. You can make pesto. You can chop them up and put it in dressings. You can also just leave some of it attached to your carrots when you roast it, and then you're getting more greens, which I always think is probably a good thing. Amy can tell us more about that. Yeah, definitely. Do you want me to jump in here and talk yeah. a little bit about the veggies? Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, well, and I was going to mention for those of you that maybe are following a low sodium diet or concerned about the brine having a salt in it, um, I did a little research uh, just to see like, well, I wonder how much salt does get absorbed in the meat. And um, Cooks Illustrated did a test of several different meats and looking at chicken, and these were chicken breasts, not a full chicken, um, but they used a quarter cup of salt and two quarts of water and brined for an hour. And it added about 270 milligrams of sodium, which is really about less than an eighth of a teaspoon. So really not very much. And as Julia mentioned, she didn't add any extra when she was putting it in the oven. And you, you, you might not even need it at the table either because it's been soaking in this brine solution. So it's really not adding a high level of salt. So, um, you know, if you're really, really, really needing to follow a very, very low sodium diet, you, you might do it differently, but it's really not adding a significant amount of sodium. It's just adding, adding a lot of great flavor. Um, and the other thing, for those of you that were maybe using a, a chicken breasts or a different type of uh, chicken meat, sometimes, manufacturers actually inject the chicken with a uh, salt uh, or a brine or a broth to kind of plump up the chicken and it makes it saltier. So you can look at the label, it's required that that be stated on the label, although it's not always very obvious, um, but you probably wouldn't want to buy that kind of chicken and then brine it also because that would be kind of extra. Really good point. Definitely don't do that. And I, I would Say, unless it's like a budget thing and it's on sale and it, it's a really good option for you uh, that week, then just try to maybe avoid pre brined and injected chicken. It's, uh, it's a lot better like making your own salad dressings or making your own snacks, knowing what you're putting into it. I, I don't, I wouldn't get that. Um, if you are making a vegetarian or, or vegan version of this dish, um, I am recently obsessed with roasting whole heads of cauliflower, and um, you can pour all kinds of delicious sauces over it, like a tahini sauce or uh, marinara sauces. You can kind of bread them. You can do lots of wonderful things. The uh, flavors and herb combinations that we're using tonight with the chicken and the veggies are a really great uh, complement to a whole head roasted cauliflower as well. So. That you would roast at an extremely high heat, about 500 degrees, for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then turn it down to 350 and keep it going until your knife kind of just slides through the cauliflower uh, like butter. Um, it probably another maybe 20 minutes. It it holds itself up really well, still just attached to the core. So all you want to do is remove leaves and wash it, and then you 
Uh, put some olive oil or coconut oil if you prefer. Um, just a little bit of canola would be good too. You're taking the oven up pretty high, although the olive oil isn't going to burn. You Blending it with something else just only helps the high heat factor. Um, you then roast it on a sheet pan with the thyme uh, parsley. We used uh, sage, and um, I definitely recommend uh, fennel seed. You can toast that and then mix that into the olive oil, slather it up, toast it on a foil lined sheet pan, and roast it until it's nice and tender. You, you do the high heat at the beginning to get that really nice browning and then turn it down to cook it all the way through. And then it just kind of falls apart, like you carve it like you would maybe a chicken, you just sort of, it's delicious. And you can serve it again with any kind of sauces or then with a different assortment of veggies on the side. Or I am adding the cauliflower to our vegetable assortment instead of roasting it whole. To do that, I'm just going to cut it in half right through the stem. We find that core, which we want to definitely cut around and remove. And that's really easy. You just kind of stick your knife in and twist. It just sort of comes all off. You lose um, the least amount of waste that, that way. If you wanted to get little teeny tiny florets, you can cut it closer to the top. But I want, I want to use all of those stem pieces. It's really good. And just keep it nice and big and chunky. So, so Julia, a couple questions. Oh yeah. Uh, if we're says if we are throwing in different veggies, are there any ones we should be careful to do more or less time in the oven? Yeah, definitely. Really good question. So a lot of the ones that I'm using here have a similar water content, so they're gonna take the same amount of time. And if I had something maybe like butternut squash, which is a lot tougher, a lot more fiber, that's gonna take a lot more time in the oven. So I would. If I want that on the same sheet pan, just for efficiency sake, I would cut that very small because then the smaller pieces are gonna cook quickly in about the same time as a large piece of water logged kind of veggie would. Um, and then you have the much, 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 much more water infused veggies like zucchini. Summer squashes have so much water in them, things like eggplant, um, that they only need a little bit of time in the oven. Mushrooms, for example. Um, you could absolutely roast some of those on separate sheet pans so that you can pull them out when they're done. That's how I do large batches of veggie prep. Um, so the collie and the carrots would be on one tray because they cook at the same time. Asparagus and snap peas would be on the same tray. They cook around the same time. Just sort of think about how big they are, how much water they seem to have in them. Um, and honestly, a lot of it just comes with experience, but knowing things like the very watery squash, summer squashes and mushrooms and uh, very, very, very tender leafy greens like baby spinaches and things, they need zero time to cook practically. And then these are gonna only take about 12 to 15 minutes in a, in a high hot oven. So then you've got your like mid range veggies that kind of take around the same time. And then root vegetables and really, really thick hearty vegetables take even longer. So you would, Splitting those up on a different sheet pan might be a good idea, or just adjusting the size you cut them. Um, if I had zucchini on this, I would cut it into very large pieces so that as it cooks, as long as these need to cook, the zucchini isn't going to completely disintegrate. It'll still be a pretty big piece of zucchini. Does that make sense? I hope that Definitely. helps. Definitely. And then another question, do yeah. you have to use fresh herbs for brining or are dried okay? Dried are totally okay, yeah. If you can't find or don't want to go to the store to get fresh herbs, that's, especially now, just use whatever's easiest and what you can find. That's perfectly all right. Dried herbs tend to have a little bit more condensed flavor. Forgot what word I was starting to say. It's a little bit more um, pungent. It's just been dried in there. So um, you would use maybe just a little bit less, although, uh, an extra flavorful chicken brine is not going to hurt, especially when it comes to the dried herbs, spices, and like seasonings. The salt and the sugar, you want to leave that at the basic ratio. But if you throw and want to throw in more spices and more dried herbs, can't really hurt it. Um, but you just keep a balance of things. If you used all allspice, it would be a little overwhelming. Or if you used just parsley, you wouldn't really taste much. So you, do you want to keep a balance of things, but dried is a perfectly reasonable alternative. 
Also for the roasting of the veggies, I'm using fresh thyme because I have it. I could find that this week, but if you do have dry thyme, that works just as well. It's gonna be really delicious. You would just use, um, I said about eight sprigs. I'm going for about a tablespoon of chopped fresh thyme. So in dry thyme, maybe a couple teaspoons. So you just take it down a notch. Yeah, definitely use what you can find and what you have. That's a great, great thing. So I have my pick thyme. Um, I just, here, I'll, to show you, picking thyme is tedious, but you just have to drag across the, the stem. Uh, so I've got my stem here and I wanna gently pinch at the base and then kind of pull my finger up to the top and that just pulls off the leaves. And sometimes you get the top of the stem, which is very tender and edible. You don't have to necessarily remove all of that. It's just the bottom thick woody stem that you want to just remove all the leaves from. So you can do that by gently pinching and sort of dragging it off and then picking the stem, the top stem apart. So you've got your pick time. Add that in, a little bit more can't hurt. I love time. There's a lot of different varieties in cultivars of thyme. I know I have some in my garden that I use for a ground cover. It's called red thyme. I've never cooked with it, but I'm like, I wonder if I can just go cut <laughs> some of this off. Um, That's what I'm gonna try. <laughs> if it was sold as a ground cover, I would definitely double check that it's an edible variety edible. because some of them are not, unfortunately. Um, the bees love them though, I'm sure. Uh, but it is not not guaranteed. In fact, some rosemary are just for like a, adornment now. There's 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 cooking herbs and then non-cooking herbs. So make sure that you are checking before That's you good to know. in the yard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for our veggies, we are going to be tossing this with olive oil. I'm using an olive oil canola blend, uh, and which I make and mix in this bottle. Um, and our thyme and then salt and pepper. I'm gonna salt and pepper it after I lay it out on the sheet pan so that I make sure I get a nice even covering. Um, sometimes when you toss it in the bowl, it sticks to like one piece of cauliflower right inside the nooks and crannies and then it doesn't spread out very well. So doing it on the sheet pan just works a little bit better for me. I'm going to, it's about two tablespoons of the olive oil or oil blend. Anytime you're roasting vegetables, you wanna make sure that you're getting a good coating. You can always add more oil, so go a little under if you need to, um, but you don't want there to be a bunch of oil swimming in the bottom of your bowl after you've put your veggies on the sheet pan. That bowl is a waste of oil and you're throwing some money away there, but also um, it actually can saturate the veggies a little too much. That probably means they're maybe a little too well coated. You don't want them swimming. You don't want to like, the oven frying your veggies per se, you just don't want them to dry out and burn and stick while they cook. There are some vegetables, depending on the cooking method, that you really do need a lot of oil. Mushrooms will soak up all of it. You can put more on than it seems like where to go. <laughs> so you just know that it's there, but it seems like it soaks it all up and it's not gonna work. Same thing with eggplant. I think that's just because they do have, they're so porous. So, well coated, I can see that everything is nice and shiny, but not swimming or dripping in oil. That's what we want. I have another sheet pan with foil on it. I'm going to bring over here. Just gonna lay it all out in as even of a layer as you can. The more uh, surface contact your vegetables have with the sheet pan, the more caramelization is going to happen, which means the more flavor you're going to get in the end. Got a lot of really delicious things going in here. So, oh yes, I love the timing. The timer is just about to go off. My time, I'm gonna do that all over. The great variety of different veggies there. It's so pretty too, isn't it? Just mm -hmm. pick the most colorful things you can find at the farmer's market, the cauliflower, the purple, yellow, and white cauliflower were all the same price this week. So why That's not get, yeah, why not get the fun ones? 
Yeah, the cauliflower, you know, the, the different colors actually have different flavonoids, so different types of antioxidants, but all of them are great. They're all considered cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts, uh, cabbage, broccoli. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful way to get your fiber, vitamin C, um, antioxidants. Um, there's so many different ways to make cauliflower. I know you've alluded to it, Julia, in a lot of your cooking programs that you could substitute cauliflower uh, for a lot of the meats and other things like that. All right, sorry to interrupt. This is a moment. Uh, we are going to um, lay out something to not melt my cutting board. Um, while we were talking there, you saw I just sprinkled, there was a pinch of salt and a heavy pinch of pepper on these vegetables. So once we get the chicken dealt with, they're both going to go back into the oven, which I'm now turning down to 375. Okay. So using two very dry towels. If you have oven mix, that's great. Just make sure they're really not worn through. This is an incredibly hot pan coming out of a 475 degree oven. So be really aware. If you're using a, a towel that even has the faintest hint of damp, dampness, it will conduct that heat so violently quickly into your skin. So don't use a towel that has even the remotest bit of wetness to it, please. So very dried out. I'm starting to already get really, really browned and crispy tips on the wings. I'm getting browning happening over here, but I'm very dried out. That's what I'm looking for because um, while well, you rendered out some of that, uh, a good amount of the fat, and so it is going to now just crisp up and take all, a lot of the flavor and soaking in from the oil, which is going to make it even more brown and crispy and delicious. Um, you could just kind of pour it all over, but then you'd be wasting a lot of the oil. I'm going to be using a silicone brush and putting it into a little bowl just because then I have a more control. If I pour it over and then most of it falls off the side, I'm like, oh, dang it, wait, wait. So just dab your brush into the oil and then spread it over the top. You're not too seriously concerned about the bottom. Obviously, if you don't even have it up on a rack, if yours is just directly on the sheet pan, then you're not concerned about the bottom at all. But we are trying to get underneath where the leg and the thigh are. You wanna get that skin just a little bit coated. Um, the signs of trussing. You can absolutely trust your chicken, and I think that honestly, it does create a little bit more even of a cooking style, and you get like a tight little tied up bird, and so you can baste it better. That is a reason that I like to do that, but um, it's also not necessary, and I don't, uh, you have to have like kitchen twine specifically for that. So just in the, oh, I'm pouring oil on the ground. In the essence of just getting it done like a normal weeknight, you don't have to trust, you're still gonna get a really nice roast. So I'm making sure that I'm getting a little, at least a little bit on that bottom side. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so there was someone asking about the benefit of using canola oil and olive oil blend. Is it just for saving money or are there other advantages? Mostly it's for saving money. Sorry, I didn't want to spill a uh, slip on that oil. <clears throat> Mostly it is for saving money. Uh, olive oil can withstand very, very high heat. It doesn't burn. Um, to me, it starts to taste bitter the higher the temperature, just because. It's got, it's got olive in it, you know, the higher you cook that, it, it will cook. And I'm extremely sensitive to things that are bitter. So much so, uh, like, you know, those little strips you test in junior high to see if you're, I, it may be gag, it's so awful. I, I can't do bitter stuff. So it's really just a personal thing. I like to save the money because olive oil is very expensive and canola oil is not. And, um, it just kind of helps reduce that slight bitter aftertaste that I get when I roast at a high heat. And they're both unsaturated, monounsaturated fats. Um, I mean, they contain polyunsaturated too, but they're high in monounsaturated, so both are equally heart healthy. So um, either either one is great. 
Uh, I think a combination, olive oil in particular, has a lot of phenolic compounds. So having a little bit of olive oil in there is definitely probably an advantage. Nice, yeah. I use a 50-50 blend. Um, and that just, it really stretches the dollar on the olive oil. And uh, I use the just plain bottle of extra virgin olive oil for finishing things, the things that you're gonna like taste, that you really want to taste like a really nice tasting olive oil, like a salad dressing or make a nice hummus and you drizzle the top with a good olive oil. That's what using the 100% the extra high quality olive oil would be for and then for every day cooking over and over and over, which I do every day over and over and over, um, it would be very expensive if I just used olive oil. Yeah. So 375, we turned that down when I pulled everything out. The chicken got basted nicely on all sides as well as I could, back in at the center rack, and then the veggies are on the rack just below that. Um, that should only take about 10, 12 minutes or so for the veggies to get to at least where I want to make sure that I've got my eyes on them. We might need to spin them around. As usual, ovens are never quite even on any side. So to get that consistent love, we wanna give it a 180 uh, as needed. So that is all kind of working now. We're at that beautiful point in this dinner where if it were me at home on a weeknight or a Sunday or whenever, I would be finishing those dishes so that when dinner is done, the rest of the night is free and easy, and you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But luckily, we didn't really make a huge mess today. I had that one bowl to mix the veggies in, and we're going to have some sheet pans with some foil helping make it a little easier in the end, I hope. Um, at that same point, if you were doing the cauliflower about 15 to 20 minutes in on the super high heat, you would also want to turn it down. I would drop it from about 500 to about... 375 is a good roast depending on your oven because it's going to need to cook through 350, 375. Um, and then it just depends on how roasty, how caramelized you want the outside. But as soon as a chef's knife or a skewer goes, you know, through the core of the cauliflower, then it's good to go. Um, the more you roast it, the more of that like delicious, smoky, caramelized, roasty flavor you're going to get. Because it is such a hearty vegetable, like other cruciferous vegetables, you can, in its whole form, you can, you can really go for it in the oven for a good amount of time. Um, and then, yeah, an assortment of sauces would be really nice, but uh, just maybe some garlic oil and then serving it with the veggies. Some, uh, I've been really obsessed with making different, like, tahini sauce and pouring that over uh, you can roast it with some turmeric, different kinds of spices. That's a different menu. But yeah, roasting a whole cauliflower, it gives you a sense of like making something big and dramatic and beautiful um, and comforting and hearty, but very affordable and <laughs> extremely plant-based. <laughs> so. Yes, and it has quite a few really protective compounds in it. Uh, sulforaphane is an antioxidant that it has. And it may help to reduce the risk of cancer, heart disease, and potentially even diabetes. Um, decrease risk of colorectal cancer. Um, so lots of great properties of, of cauliflower. Yeah. And I wanted to point out, I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but Julia cut the cauliflower from the bottom, which I heard a chef talking about that once, and it was like, ah, wow. <laughs> yeah. I used to cut it from the top, and it would crumble and make a big mess like I'd still get my pieces but it would make a lot of waste and a mess a lot of those like um, riced cauliflower without wanting it to be riced right yeah um, the easiest thing to do for cauliflower and broccoli works this way also is to turn it upside down and as close to where the the, the floret stem and the core meet just kind of jab your knife in there and then twist and then all of the florets just sort of break off in large pieces. And then if you want them to be smaller, you can easily just kind of break them up with your hands. That's the best way to do it without creating a big mess of uh, cauliflower dust. Yeah, it's a common problem, definitely. Uh, and that happens when we're cutting like 50 pounds of cauliflower and you're just kind of trying to hack it up because you're getting it done as fast as possible. But 
it is the fastest and easiest way just to, and you can even do it from a whole head of cauliflower. Just turn it upside down and jab your knife in and then twist and it'll pop off all of the florets. Yeah. That is a helpful little trick. I'm glad you caught that. Yeah. And so too, I think, you know, if you have a big family, you might eat the whole chicken tonight, right? But if you're like Julia, a single person, um, you have chicken left over to use in a variety of ways. So yes. just wondering, Julia, how do you plan to use your leftovers? Really good question because it's one of my, this is, this is basically what I do. I roast a whole chicken uh, for meal prep and then incorporate that in a lot of different ways. Normally I would be roasting my vegetables on separate sheet pans so that I could be flavoring them all a little bit differently. Like I really uh, love curry cauliflower. I really love broccoli with a, just a hint of ginger and soy sauce. I really like different kind of roasts. So I would do those separately and then I would roast a whole chicken. That is the, my most frequent uh, style of meal prep. So this chicken is going to be tonight my little nice uh, plated French Parisian kind of country dinner. And then um, I really uh, probably will make some chicken burritos. I really like using chicken instead of uh, beef or steak or ground meats. And I make a, like a Spanish rice, guacamole. I put the chicken, I put a bunch of sauteed veggies with cumin and chili powder wrap that up in a whole wheat tortilla. I really like chicken. Obviously, I've got a theme going. I make quesadillas a lot. Um, I make stir fry a lot. And probably by the time it is mostly like one breast and the carcass by the end of the week, then I make soup. Yeah, that's a good one. Soup is great or making little bowls or wraps. Definitely um, goes on top of salads throughout Putting the it on your salad. Yeah, yeah. I just made my first uh, homemade um, Caesar dressing for a Caesar salad. And nice. So, did yeah, you I have some of that left over. Say that again. Did you use actual anchovy? I couldn't find them. So I use anchovy paste, which oh, okay. I've never bought before. So. <laughs> but it's the same. They just did the work for you. That's, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Making things like that from scratch is fun when you realize like, oh, it tastes just like Caesar. Like, well, yeah, that's what And I didn't know what was, what was Caesar dressing made of. I did not know. Uh, <laughs> made of so much mayonnaise. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, it pretty much is just mayonnaise with some anchovies and garlic and other flavors going on. Um, and a lot of people assume it's Italian. Definitely not. From our friends in Mexico, a chef working at a hotel in Tijuana, I think. Um, he might have been of, of Italian descent because I think that his name was Cardini. I think that that, or that original brand of Caesar's dressing is from the original chef, although I'm sure we could fact check that on Google. Um, I think that's the story, the famous story of Caesar, Caesar salad and dressing because they needed to make something quick for someone special who came in and they didn't have much, so they put some lettuce and a thing and made this aioli dressing and the Caesar. Well, one thing that you always tell us is to like read the directions through and make sure you understand. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I missed the part that said the six cloves of garlic should be divided. And I oh. put all six in the dressing. Oh. So it's a good thing I really like garlic because yes. it was really garlicky, but it was wonderful. Good. But I was like, whoops, I put all <laughs> this in the dressing. <laughs> That is a lot of garlic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's delicious though. That's good for you. As we've learned many times, we use it a lot in this workshop. I love garlic. I'm, I'm almost out of garlic, which is a crazy thought. Um, we do have another question. Uh, oh, for cauliflower steak, do oh, yes. you just cut it in half or how do you do that? Or if would it be you, best to just roast? Or would yeah, you I'm just roasting it whole roasting. right now. Yeah, I'm kind of big on roasting it whole right now, but not necessary. If you want to cut it down into steaks, that's really great because then it's pre-portioned and you can even baste into uh, each steak individually and then you get a really nice crusty roast on each person's piece if you were serving it that way. So I would, it starts out with the shopping and getting the largest head of cauliflower that you can find because as we just talked about, there's sometimes a lot of waste and little droppings and bits that break off. So you would cut 
um, just the very edges off to kind of create a squared edge of the cauliflower to start on both sides, creating what looks then like a weird cauliflower loaf. And then from there, you, you kind of need to keep the steaks pretty thick to start out with. So it depends on how many people you're serving. You might need to buy more than one cauliflower, but if it's just for a couple people, uh, in my experience, you can get four to five good, uh, about inch to an inch and a quarter thick steak uh, from a good regular white cauliflower. So that's a really good option. And then I would lay it on the sheet pan and uh, roast it at that super high heat. The cauliflower, you might wanna put a little bit of the olive oil on to start with and then continue to baste as you roast, especially in steak form, because you might get a little too dry of a experience, but um, you still do want to start out at a high heat, even with the steaks, because then you're going to get that really nice browning and caramelizing and stuff happening on all of that surface area, uh, and then turn it down and let it finish. The steaks are going to take very little time to finish at that point, because they've already been broken down into a smaller piece. So, just check with your knife or skewer uh, about 10 minutes into cooking after you've turned the heat down. And if you wanted to at that point, you could baste it with a sauce. Like I really love making barbecue roasted cauliflower sticks. So I make my homemade barbecue sauce and after I've done a high heat roast, then I baste it with the barbecue sauce during the rest of cooking and I've got what passes a long way for like just a delicious barbecue dinner. So uh, good way to sneak some veggies into your life, even if you're not a vegetarian, which I'm trying to do more. I'm trying to only eat um, really sustainable meat and only a couple of times a week. Maybe I get it all from the farmer's market now. That's pretty much where I do a lot of my shopping. Which I'm I made a buffalo cauliflower in my air fryer last yes. week and my family loved it. Yeah. My kids especially, like, like they're like, wow, I think this is even maybe better than regular yeah. chicken buffalo yeah, wings. It's, it's easier to eat. You don't have the mess of like the bones and all that other stuff. And it takes half the time to cook. And you're not dealing with deep fried most of the time, unless you were to batter it and deep fry it. But you don't have to do that to get a really delicious kind of savory thing happening with, yeah, I love buffalo cauliflower. That's another good one. You can even mimic the like spicy um, salt and pepper, uh, Chinese crispy chicken wings, that kind of flavor. You can like marinate cauliflower with some soy sauce and ginger, and then uh, roast it really high with some scallions and kind of, uh, you can do a lot. Sriracha even. Yeah, yeah, I'm obsessed with sriracha. Okay, I am going to turn everything a little bit. Um, I want everything to get nice and even. I'll show you here. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, you don't want to do that to your oven. I was mostly just saying sorry to the oven. <laughs> you really don't want to let the door to your oven slam. Uh, it can like decalibrate the thermometer that tells when it's at the right temperature. So if you want a nice calibrated oven, don't slam the door very often. You can see on this though, hopefully, I think. Let's see. I'm getting some browning on like one side. You can tell like one part of my oven is roasting very nicely. So that's why we spin everything around to get a really nice roast all the way around, no matter what it is that we're roasting. Back in at that other direction. Wanna check the veggies. Yeah. So I've got them on the bottom rack, which is um, a bonus part about doing these in the oven together because it gets more caramelized closer to the bottom of the oven. So you wanna be careful that it's not burning, but you can see that when I flip the cauliflower over, the part that was touching the pan is getting a really nice crispy kind of browning on it. Yeah, starting to get a little golden on some of these pieces. So, and my smaller bits of veggies, like my small, Snap peas, they're getting tender. They're, they're not soggy. They're not, um, they're not even that super soft yet, but they are about halfway there. So I spun that 180 as well. Turn this back on for another, oh, we wanna baste the chicken. Sorry, I was so excited to show you the like uneven brown spots. 
You want to make sure that you baste it at least one more time so that we get that a really nice uh, brown color on the skin. And it's mostly where it's going to dry out the most, which is on top, covering the breast with as much of that oil or oil butter blend, whatever you're using. The dark meat has more of its own fat, both in the skin and around the muscle. So it's not going to dry out as much, but you still want to get a nice crispy browning. So you try to get that basting underneath if you can, as much around the sides as possible. That's all you're trying to do. Try to get those wing tips well coated. They just keep burning, which is actually some people's favorite part. All right, back in the oven you go. Probably for just this next maybe 15 minutes, we should be right on schedule for me to at least be able to show you a nice plate up. Um, the most important thing to learn here, obviously, if you are cooking with chicken, is to make sure that it's cooked properly before you try to serve it or eat it. Chicken is one of the things that if eaten even a little bit under is very dangerous for you. Um, so using a thermometer is the best. Uh, an easiest way to know that. If you have a meat thermometer, that's fantastic. You would want to stick the plunger, the tip, right into the fattest part of the, well, the thickest part of the breast would do, but also you want to check the dark meat. The dark meat can cook, take longer to cook than the white meat, so you want to stick it towards the area of the thigh just to get a general reading that the chicken is at 165 degrees, a reading of 165 internal temperature is the health department approved uh, safe zone for cooked chicken. If it's around 160 when you take it out of the oven, it's going to continue cooking. Carryover cooking lasts about 20 minutes, depending on what you're cooking. If it's a large piece of meat, it might even take longer, but if it's a cauliflower, it's gonna be less, just it cools down faster. But um, Carryover heat with a lot of cooking uh, can be up to 20 minutes. And so if I read my chicken at about 160, 162, I know it's gonna, it's gonna finish cooking um, because I need to let it rest for at least 10 minutes after I've taken it out of the oven before I carve it. Carving it while it is fresh out of the oven is bad news bears. You're gonna get all of the juicy, tender, delicious flavor we try to keep inside the bird by brining it is going to kind of spill out all over your cutting board and then you're going to just end up again with dry chicken. Um, there's a lot of like myths and urban legends about cooking meats and different cuts of different proteins. Um, you can't necessarily like seal in juices. That's not necessarily how it works. They seal themselves in. That, that's how that happens. But you can let them out too early. You can open the floodgates early by not letting it rest. That's why all recipes and all good chefs uh, show in their TV shows. You want to let this rest for about five, 10 minutes. So you put a little tent of foil over it so it doesn't get cold. And then you come back in about 10 minutes and then you carve it because it's going to keep all that juicy deliciousness inside instead of spilling all out. And it's really good to know because I'm one of those impatient chefs that's like, oh, it doesn't need to rest. No, I definitely We're should. all hungry. We'll just cut right into it. I know it's frustrating. I actually have to like convince myself to build the resting time into the rest of the planning. Like, because if everything else is ready to go, then you're like waiting on meat to rest. So I'm usually at that point, that's the 10 minutes I save for maybe finishing up the dishes or making a sauce or a gravy if you are, or uh, dressing the salad and getting the last little bits of things ready so that you're not just like staring at the chicken, <laughs> which gets really difficult to do. I just saw somebody ask about the pieces of chicken, and yes, you can do this exact same thing with uh, pieces. If you want just white meat in your family, get a whole bunch of chicken breasts and do the exact same process, except, and this can be a note for everybody, if you're using chicken breasts only, I would, I would brine it that morning, not the night before. They can absorb a lot more of the flavor and after cooking can be a little bit like chicken jerky. It's, a, it's an odd flavor that I can't describe any other way but that. And that's not what you're going for. So 
if you're only using breasts, then you only need to brine them for like that part of that day. So I would throw that in in the morning. But if you're using an assortment of lots of dark meat, white meat, different kinds of cut chicken, then yeah, do the same process. Brine it in the fridge overnight. Same brine, same thing. You still want to roast it at a really high heat with um, no basting at first, just nice and dry pieces of chicken. And then same process, turn it down, baste it. It's just going to cook way faster, which is probably a lot nicer for a lot of families and a lot of weeknight meals. So um, if it's just laid out breasts, legs, thighs, uh, you could probably roast that for about 15 minutes at high heat and then probably just about 20 more, 15 to 20 more at the regular temperature and then they'll probably be worth checking after that. Uh, the breast especially, a separate breast doesn't take very long to cook, especially if it's boneless. This, this is all another thing. If it's bone in meat, it takes a little bit longer, boneless meat, much faster cooking. So if you're looking for real fast, brine delicious chicken, go for those boneless cuts, brine it just the day of, roast it for, I think, you know, half hour tops with a, a reduction in heat in the middle. And you'll have a much quicker version of this, same kind of a delicious dinner. Um, I really, I wanted you all to be able to see though just how simple and um, delicious whole roasted chicken can be. I know that for a lot of my friends, a lot of uh, people, a lot of the young students that I work with in some of these workshops, they're they're just flat out scared of trying this. And I want I want everyone to realize that chicken is um, if you eat it, if it's part of your diet and your lifestyle, then it's a beautiful blank canvas. So don't be afraid of a good whole roasted chicken because of those amazing things you can do with it throughout the week. And then making your own chicken stock from the bones is um, fantastic. Really a great thing to do. You can freeze it. It's far less sodium than any other stock or broth product you can get on the shelves. And it's more flavor, more natural deliciousness going on. So, yeah. So, Julia, have you ever heard of kick? cooking a whole chicken in a brown paper shopping bag. Okay, uh, yes. Um, I'm gonna let you all into a little bit of my family life. Um, my mother and I and our family, because of my grandmother, uh, cook our turkey in a big giant brown paper bag every Thanksgiving. That's how my mom cooks chicken, just like you're doing. She puts yeah. it in a brown paper bag. And I'm like, I hope that, and so of course I do that too, but I'm like, oh, like maybe there's some chemical being let out or maybe I, I'm going to catch my oven on fire. I don't know. People look at me like I'm crazy when I say that I no, do that. It is definitely a thing. And I think it might've been maybe a, a Midwestern thing for a minute, but uh, do you coat the bag? Cause we, we coat the bag in a, a paprika spiced canola oil and we like Ooh. so that while it steams inside it actually creates flavor but we specifically save a brown paper bag every year that we get with no ink on it no printing like mm. no store markings on it because yeah you probably don't want that on your food um it does make a tasty moist chicken though Yes, it does. It does. It roasts. It steams it inside its own little happy sack. It's the weirdest, most wonderful old-fashioned thing. My uh, my dad's mom did it. Taught my mom, and we've been doing it ever since. And even though I actually like, I don't tell them. I probably prefer an open roasted bird, but I will continue for the rest of my life making my turkey in a bag. That's just what we do. Yeah. Um, Tradition. Yeah. Yeah, that's very funny. I, so, not a lot of other people have heard of that. Yeah, so someone, including me, is looking for probably any tips you can give on cutting up the chicken. Okay, yeah, and I, that's why I really want, I really, really hope that mine gets at least close enough to being done that I can kind of uh, guide you through the cutting process by um, at least miming it for you. Um, I don't want to cut all of it up because I want to maintain my juicy, tender, delicious chicken and I don't want to cut it too early, but I am going to walk you through at least cutting half of it to show you the, the markings and how to do that. Um, let me check my veggies here. Timer's is about to go off. All right, I've got some serious sizzle. All of the water and things like that have definitely evaporated from these veggies. I've got a nice dry roast. Good caramelization happening on a lot of my 
have cauliflower starting to brown around all the edges. I'm really happy about all that. Yummy flavor. My carrots are tender. My fingernail is going right in. Don't do that. You all know I have very, very weird fingers. Please use a tongs and a knife and a toothpick to test your veggies. But as long as everything is nice and tender, um, I am good with this. I am partial to vegetables that still have about 10% of their natural, uh, fresh crispiness to them. So I'm not going to take these to like soggy mode, which is good. You don't, you want to keep them really kind of bright and fresh and crispy. Um, and now we're going to take a peek, just a quick peek. I think it might need some time, but I do want to show you, guide you through the carving process. And I think that would be easier using this as an actual example. Okay, yeah, I am going to um, walk you through this for now. See, my dark meat is looking done. I might, I might be done here. I just want a little bit more color on some of the skin, which I can get uh, by turning it up just a little bit, raising the chicken up a little bit higher to the top of the oven. I'm going to try to ch check the thermometer. So you could stick it in completely horizontally towards the fat end of the breast, which would be great. I'm gonna kind of angle it that way just because um, you wanna avoid the bone, you wanna avoid cartilage, you wanna make sure that you're just getting it into a thick piece of meat. Uh, because those other things are going to affect the temperature. The bone and the cartilage are going to be hotter. They maintain that they, they, they just get hotter and they stay hotter. So that could skew your thermometer reading. You want to make sure that you are really just checking the medius bit of the, the flesh itself. I am rising steadily. I am at 160 now. Yes, I was a little early there. That's okay. Also importantly, when you poke that hole into your chicken breast, if you pull it out and juices, especially slightly pink or kind of uh, way too yellowish juices flow out right away, then it's not done yet. Uh, my chicken breast is dry. There's nothing really flowing out of that hole I just made and I was already reading at 160 in the breast. One thing without even having to take the uh, temperature, I don't know if you can see this, the skin is starting to tear away around the legs where that tendon is inside. And in about five more minutes, all of this skin would start to tear and my legs would start to kind of fall apart. That might be even a little overdone in some meats. That's usually how our turkey in a bag comes out. It just kind of like, it's so steamy and delicious. It just sort of falls apart. But for this, you want it to kind of hold together a little bit more. So I'm gonna find that section in the back where the drumstick and the thigh area is, but find a nice meaty section of it, not into the bone, just into the flesh. And I wanna check the temperature of the dark meat. Oh man, that's skyrocketing. I'm already at 173. So I'm good, my chicken is done. I'm gonna show you quickly here, general carving technique. Um, all right, uh, here we go. This is, you're gonna watch the fun chef trick. We use tongs for everything. Um, everything, they're just the extension of our fingers. If you don't have a knife in your hand, you have a pair of tongs in your hand usually. And if you're a real chef, you have to clack them before you use them. It's just the way it works. So you can stick your tongs right into the cavity of the chicken sorry, chicken, and kind of lift it up. Let any of the juices drip out onto the sheet pan so they're not gonna pour out all over your board. And then I'm gonna take that over here. You wanna use a cutting board that has a moat on it. One of these little cavities here that's called a moat. Technically some people call it a blood moat, that's horrifying, but there you go. Um, that's to catch any juices while you're carving meats and things that might be releasing a lot of water and stuff like that. So I'm just going to carve half of this so you can kind of see and then so I can maintain the other half and put it back in the oven and get a little browning action going on. Uh, you want to start with the, well, 
Some chefs start with the, the breast, but I start with the leg and the thigh. You can just cut right through this line that separates the breast and the leg. You can all see this in this camera, right? Is this close enough? Okay. Just slice down through that, and it just kind of opens up. You can fold it back. Oh yeah, I definitely need to cook this longer. Mine is still pink inside. So once you've folded that back, you can cut both of them off. Honestly, I, sometimes I just use my hands. You just kind of break it off. But there's a line between the rib cage and the thighs that you just cut all the way down through and you spread that out and you can cut through the bone right at the where the rib cage and the chicken thigh meet. Cut that off. And then you would do that on both sides, and honestly, it, it splits. Um, it splits right where the spine and the rib cage, the tailbone and the rib cage meet. So you could tear this off, kind of cut into there. Very hot. And you would cut off your leg thigh combo right at where the See here where the back rib cage meets uh, the spine. So you just put your knife in there and snap it through. The bone, if you if you even do meet the bone, it's very, very small and easy to cut through once it's cooked. So you would do that on both sides, cut through that uh, skin line, that fat line that separates the breast and the leg here. And then they're very easy to just kind of snap off the sides. And then cutting the leg and the thigh apart, there, we call this the magic line. There's a, a little line of uh, like fat and skin right here that you can see that separates the leg and the thigh. If you cut along that line, you will cut right through the joint of the leg and thigh, and so you don't cut bone, which a lot of people do accidentally, and then you get kind of like broken, sharp chicken bone, which you wanna try to avoid. So. When you're cutting the leg and the thigh apart from each other, turn it upside down and on the underside here, you'll be able to see this sort of little magic line, the fat line that divides the thigh and the leg. Chop right through that, that's where the joint meets and you'll be able to cut through cartilage instead of bone. Okay, so that's that one. Cutting the breast off. I usually cut the wings off first, so you take that around the joint and you would Cut just straight through the wing joint, which you can expose after you cut around the fat here. But to cut through the breast, primarily, you start in the middle. There's a little feather bone here. So you cut on either side of that, down each side of the cartilage in the middle. And then it, it kind of falls away from the center and you can then turn it the other way and cut um, around like you're going from the side of the cartilage here to the bottom, and then you go back down through this way. So you are actually cutting the shape of the breast, but it's all along this line of cartilage in the center. That's the only thing in the end that's kind of holding it all on there. So once you've got it cut from the center, you can then just use your knife to keep cutting it away and, until it comes completely off. Pretty simple that way. I'm very sorry that this is not done far enough for me to want to completely cut it because I need to get it back into the oven. It really only needs about 10 more minutes, sadly. So I will absolutely send pictures. Um, if it would help anybody, I could take pictures of the carving process. Maybe I could record myself doing that and then send that in an email if anybody would be interested in that. Um, otherwise, I hope that that guideline kind of helps get you through the basic carving process. And then for service, you would just put this, your carved chicken, onto a lovely platter with your veggies spread out and your chicken laid out. I like serving things like this family style so you can really arrange it to show off the whole work that you've done. Um, although if you wanted to do plated, then take orders and what everybody wants. You put that individually, you make a little mound of veggies in the middle of the plate, and then you lay your chicken up against that. And that's a beautiful, lovely kind of presentation for a kind of country people dinner from France. I mean, this is what the farm people would have eaten 100 years ago.
and they were lucky for it, I think. <laughs> um, if there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer them or take them. I know that we're right at the end, but if anybody, if you want yeah, to- We had one more question about the brining of the whole chicken. Um, do you do it in a bag or in a pot? And do the amount of herbs vary if the bird is bigger or smaller? Good question. Um, if it's, if it's like, if you're talking like a Cornish hen versus a turkey, then yeah, you would need to make more brine, but just a small chicken versus maybe a little bit bigger chicken. Uh, as long as the four quart amount of liquid, which is a gallon total of the brine, as long as that's gonna cover the bird, you don't need to change the ratio of the ingredients inside the brine. Uh, if you are doing more than one bird or large batches of this, then yeah, we made, we made like 50 gallon batches of this. And so it was whole bunches of sage and parsley. And then we would marinate about 85 chickens uh, a week for weddings and stuff. Um, but you don't know. So if it's just one chicken, um, or even if you're just doing cut chicken pieces, don't really change the amount of herbs or seasonings in there, unless you are talking like, like a quail uh, or Cornish hen to a giant turkey. But then even then you would need to make at least three times this amount to cover a whole turkey because you want the whole thing fully submerged in the liquid to flavor the whole thing throughout. Um, it sounds like it might be hard to do in a bag. It probably, you'd have to have a really, really big It would have bag. to be a pretty big Ziploc and it would have, you would have to really trust that that bag is well sealed. Um, the safest thing is in like a large plastic Tupperware if you have a big enough one or a big mixing bowl. I did mine in um, this pot, it's a, like a stock pot. One chicken fit perfectly in there. It's spaced in my fridge off to one side and it sat there overnight. Uh, it's gonna be very delicious. Great, and it does look like people would appreciate uh, pictures or something with the carving carving okay yeah i know that's a key part of this um and if you are willing to stick around for the next like 15 minutes i'm happy to to do it but i will record it and then uh, i'll blast that out to the email list just so that you have that as a helpful uh extra add-on for sure um it's not it's really simple one thing I recommend is having a good knife, a sharp knife, especially if being sharp is very helpful. And then if you have a knife that is like this, that is, um, this is called a carving or a boning knife. So it's actually meant to help get around the breast. It's thinner, uh, it's pointy, you know. This is a little harder to maneuver around like that breast, although it works great. A chef's knife is all you really need in life, but if you have, a knife that's a little bit skinnier at the tip, then you can kind of really uh, carve around that cartilage and around the breastbone a little bit easier. So that's just one thing that might help. Um, but I will absolutely record it and I will email that out to, I'll just email it to everybody who signed up. So you all are already on that list. Um, and look on our Instagram for the final picture uh, uh, of my plating of the dish. And please, if you make this, when you make this, let, let me see pictures, send them to us. We get very proud. Um, I'm really happy that people are cooking so much. It makes me very pleased. We just have a couple more of these, I think. The term is winding down, which makes me a little sad. I was thinking next week of shrimp scampi, um, which you can do with anything. You can do chicken. You can do uh, lots of different veggies, like mushrooms, zucchini, and bell pepper as your shrimp instead. Um, it's just that super garlic heavy, um, herb, herby, delicious, scampi, and going for more of a stove top feel next week. <laughs> Keep that oven off. <laughs> Sounds wow. good. Awesome. Um, will we do this in the fall? That's a really good question. We don't know. We have a lot of things still up in the air and I don't want to uh, say the wrong thing. Uh, it completely, everything depends on the capacity in which we can go back to campus and the kinds of other programming that people will be requesting, but something like 
these classes will continue to go. We might even be offering programming in the summer, so don't don't wait until fall necessarily. Um, look for different things. Just keep following us on Instagram, and that's where most of uh, I'll be able to update and advertise any of the stuff. But Recreation does offer some programming over the summer, so we're really hopeful that we can continue at least with a small amount of classes while we're all still hanging out. Okay, so the roasted chicken is done. We are going to carve it now away from the bone. Um, you definitely want to let it rest for at least 10 minutes or so after it comes out of the oven when it's done so that the juices stay inside, but this is how we would carve it. I have already cut away through that dividing line between the leg and the thigh over here. I'll duplicate that on this side. I'm using a boning knife. It's not a flexible fish boning knife. Some of them bend a lot, but it will help me get around the bone, the breastbone especially, with this nice sharp curved tip there. So you just cut through that skin and fat that divides the breast from the thigh and leg combo. And then the whole thing actually detaches show you here um, where the spine and the rib cage back here in meet so technically like you can use your hands you can definitely use a knife I just lift up the the carcass here where the breasts are and I snap that back and you just break through the spine you can definitely use your knife or you can use kitchen shears that cuts through chicken bones very well so you just want to cut through where the spine and the tailbone meet the rib cage and a good chef's knife will work very well for cutting through chicken bones if you need to but right there it should be mostly cartilage so you just kind of snap it off just comes right off and cut through that back skin there are some glands and some pieces in here that you don't necessarily serve so we cut the leg and the thigh away from the center tailbone and you can do that very easily. The easiest way is to break them with your hands and they just snap in two. And you cut down either side of the tailbone, leaving that tail piece there. And you're basically just cutting around both sides of that. You can use your fingers, but the knife gets right in there, breaks away from the tailbone and it just tears right off very easily. You want to discard that. Don't necessarily want to use that for stock unless you take off all of these glands then you can use this bone and the tailbone for stock definitely. Once you've got your separate leg thigh combos here you want to find what I call the magic line in class. It's uh, the dividing fat line here between the drumstick and the thigh. Once you find that line, you just your knife should just go right through it. And that cuts between the two bones right at the joint, so you hopefully don't have any bone shards or fragments. As you cut your pieces, you set them aside onto your serving platter so that everything gets nice and arranged. I'll show you that at the end here. You find that dividing fat line. It's right between where the thigh and the leg joints meet and you just snap right through. You want to definitely try to find where those two joints meet or else you're going to be cutting through bone, um, which is doable, but then you want to make sure that you have um, gotten rid of any sharp bits or points at the end before you serve it. Okay, so for the breasts, I like to remove the wings first. I don't uh, usually eat or serve the wings, but if you do, like I usually save them for some snacks to make later, but you cut around the joint so you find underneath the wing where the shoulder would be and you cut into that joint there and it should break right off and you can find the cartilage and then you just cut around that wing joint some chefs leave that on while they carve the breast I like to take it off so that it's out of the way so you carve underneath where the shoulder meets the back of the breastplate and the, the back area here and then back around to the front where you can cut into it close to the breast try to find that joint 
slipping and sliding. This is another re reason why waiting those 10 minutes to carve is very important. You would not be able to do this with your hands um, if it was still freshly out of the oven. But if it's also still too hot for you to do with your hands and using a pair of tongs is the safest alternative or wearing a pair of gloves will definitely help reduce the heat on your fingers. So now all we have left here is the breasts. We want to remove as much of them as possible. So we cut down the middle. There is a cartilage like feather bone right down the center. You need to cut along both sides of it. You can find it with your knife. Once you've found it, then you just cut right along both sides. And that splits the breasts open. Then you just cut down alongside that cartilage, continuously separating the meat from the bone. As you're continually separating it, you go around the main breast bone here, which is also like the bottom joint of the, the inner joint of the wing there. You need to cut around that and then all the way down the side. So you get a nice piece of chicken breast. You want to be very careful. There are small bones in there at the top that if you do disconnect the wishbone, you remove that and you're left with your nice solid chicken breast. You can always cut that into slices for service. That would be nice if you're doing this family style. Missed a little bit of that chicken breast tender here, but that's okay. You can always slice that up and put that on. But you do want to try to remove all of the meat that you can because then you're left with just the carcass, which you can use for making a really nice chicken stock. So the other side, you do the same thing. You want to get in there with your knife so that it's fully separated from the cartilage here in the middle, that bone there and you cut around sort of like a big loop around to the back to where you can remove that whole breast and then you just kind of keep cutting it away remove that skin cut through there and you're good got that whole big chicken breast and all you're left with here are some scrap pieces and mostly a really good base for a good chicken stock if you wanted to slice the chicken breast to go on your platter, this is how I would do it. Whole chicken breast, you cut at a bias, starting with the tail, into about half inch to three quarter inch thick slices, at a nice bias. Then you can fan it out really nicely and it looks really lovely on the plate. Nice sliced juicy chicken breast. All right, so that's going to go on our platter here. Let me make sure I clean up a bit. I'm going to show you what this looks like. Excuse the mess. Here we have got our beautiful carved chicken with roasted market vegetables presented family style. Ta-da!